go, Mr. Chairman. Well, good morning uh, to everybody, and uh, some of our members are still coming in, but um, t uh, Mr. Morrison, our witness is here. We thank you. Uh, I want to welcome everybody uh, for coming here, and again, thank the Hudson Institute for hosting uh, today's meeting and for uh, their support since uh, we began our work in 2014. Thanks also uh, to the folks without whom we would not be here, which is the charitable donors we have, uh, most particularly the uh, Open Philanthropy Foundation. Um, three years ago, uh, this panel released uh, our national blueprint for biodefense. It was born out of our shared concern that not enough was being done to address the threats posed to our country by biological events of two uh, major kinds. The first, um, which I've learned a lot about in this experience and actually uh, learned enough to be much more worried than I was before I started, is an infectious disease pandemic. And the second, of course, is a bioterrorist attack. Uh, in our blueprint, our blueprint report, um, we reviewed the totality of the federal government's biodefense efforts, uh, found them, frankly, lacking in many ways that we documented in the report and made 33 uh, recommendations of, about how to improve them, recommendations which we believe, believe then, believe now, provide a roadmap to improving how we prepare for, uh, defend against, and respond to uh, biological threats of both kinds I've mentioned. Some of our recommendations apply to the whole of government, others to specific federal uh, programs and agencies. We assign timelines uh, for um, completing each of the 87 action items associated with our 33 recommendations, based obviously on when we felt they could reasonably be completed. So today, our panel uh, will look at how far uh, the government has come in implementing uh, those uh, recommendations uh, that we believe should have been completed in the three years since the blueprint in uh, 2015. Th this is the beginning of our assessment of, of the uh, implementation of the recommendations in, in our report. Uh, our review will culminate in a progress report, which we uh, will release uh, early next year. In this, um, I would say we are keeping the promise we made to each other, really, on the panel uh, when we began that this was not going to be another um, Washington report that was issued and then we walked away, but that uh, the subject matter here was important enough that we were going to stay together and advocate uh, for our report's implementation and that's what we uh, have been able to do and we will uh, continue to do. I welcome all of our speakers, particularly um, pleased to welcome the federal representatives uh, who are here today, both on our panels and uh, in the audience. And I, I do want to note the absence of one of the members of our panel for cause. Uh, Donna Shalala is not here because she was elected to be in the House of Representatives uh, uh, next year. I asked our, uh, as we met briefly before, I, I wanted to ask my colleagues to what extent they thought her service on this panel was responsible for her being elected. <laughs> and uh, Congressman Greenwood said uh, she overcame it to be elected. <laughs> anyway, uh, um, it, it's really, she, she has extraordinary experience, of course, uh, both as a cabinet secretary and um, more recently as the president of the University of Miami, but she was a, she's was she been a great member of the commission, and at a minimum, we know that we have an extremely informed advocate for uh, biodefense concerns in the uh, incoming uh, Congress. Uh, with that, uh, I would, I'm would i happy to call on my co-chair in this work and my dear friend, Governor Tom Ridge. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator. Just a few brief introductory remarks. Welcome all. See many familiar faces and some new faces, so we're delighted you join us today. A couple quick thoughts, if I might. 
Uh, when we embarked on this journey about three, three years ago, uh, when Senator Lieberman initially called me, we agreed that there were a couple really important characteristics that needed to be associated with this group. It had to be uh, bipartisan from the get-go, and I'm proud to say the three Republicans, the three Democrats, uh, find common cause to deal with a real threat is a good model for the men and women on the Hill to follow uh, in the future. Uh, men and women of goodwill identifying a problem, sitting down, talking and resolving differences. It's quite a, quite a remarkable process and progress has been made substantially. Part of that progress is manifested in uh, a couple of our speakers today. We'll have someone from the White House. Tim Morrison is going to talk to us a little bit about the national strategy. But when we got together, the six of us said none of us wanted to be involved in just another report that gathered dust. There are all kinds of Washington reports on shelves that do nothing but accumulate dust. So we had some very specific recommendations. We said we wanted short, intermediate, and long term. And what the strategy has done, and again, we had champions, Republicans and Democrats in the House and the Senate, in the Obama administration, now we have champions within the Trump administration, and the strategy document itself embraces at least two dozen, directly or indirectly, of our recommendations. And there's more to follow, but just the strategy alone embraces almost two-thirds of the recommendations that we put forward, for which we are very, very grateful. And it's, the process is just beginning, but we think this is the most significant step. You need a strategy, you need cross cross-budget cuts so we know exactly where all these dollars are flowing. Uh, we need to know what, where we need to close, where we need to aggregate, where we need to increase. But it's an incredibly important first step. The threat is real. It's not sexy. Nobody's talking about it. But the fact of the matter is the natural threats, we've seen it. Zika, Ebola, got it. Uh, maybe a terrorist or a nation state We'll deal with ricin or anthrax or something else. And we know full well the nation states are violating the, chem the chemical and biological weapons ban. And, and so uh, we also know that we've got a, lab a lot of laboratories in this country working on these issues. And so the threat could be as a result of an accident. So whether it's natural, whether it's generated by man, by design, or it's accidental, it's a real problem. And I'm just uh, pleased we're now in a position, particularly with our first speaker, to be talking about now how we go forward as a country based on the good work of a bipartisan group and a very dedicated staff over three years to say, OK, here's what we've seen. Here's what we concluded. Here's what we think we need to get done in the next couple of years. So it's also been a great pleasure for me to be co-chairing with my friend, Senator Lieberman. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Governor. The feeling is mutual. Senator Daschle. Thank you, Senator Lieberman, and uh, let me just say I, I want to uh, associate myself with the remarks of both of our co-chairs this morning. Uh, they have eloquently and, and very uh, articulately uh, pointed out uh, the purpose of, of this effort and, uh, and our progress to date. I think this is going to be a very productive day, and one of the reasons why is that the White House is represented here today and uh, with the presence of Director Morrison, and I welcome him in particular. Uh, as we enter a new Congress, I can't think of a more critical time to evaluate the progress made in defending this country against our biological threats. Biosurveillance and biodetection are particularly challenging, and I'm glad we're going to be discussing these very important topics today. Bioterrorism is not a thing of the distant past. The recent recent letters sent to the White House and the Pentagon show that clearly, as does the ongoing difficulty in preventing the spread of Ebola, detecting and intercepting biological threats before they've had a chance to spread is of utmost importance. We all recognize that, and that's why we're here today. Assistant Secretary McDonnell is here to address the state of BioWatch and the National Biosurveillance uh, Integration System in particular and what steps he is taking to address our recommendations and the concerns of all stakeholders. Ms. Godfrey is here to share previous and current findings by the GAO regarding these programs. And Dr. Shukat, 
uh, from CDC. We'll talk about the role her agency plays in early identification and notification of biological threats like Ebola and Zika. So we've got a lot to cover and, uh, and, a, and a very productive day in store. And I, I again reiterate, as my co-chairs have, how important it is that you're here and uh, how much we appreciate your commitment and your involvement and uh, the interest that you show by your presence this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Congressman Greenwood. Thank you, Joe, and welcome, Mr. Marsh. Thank you very much for being here. Um, I'm here by virtue of my role as the president and CEO of the Biotechnology Innovation Organization. And so a number of our companies are involved in making vaccines and also making counter medical countermeasures against uh, diseases as well as bio, uh, potential bioterror events. Um, the perspective that, that I bring to this panel, particularly on behalf of those uh, member companies, is uh, the role of innovation and uh, how challenge, how critical it is to, to our ability to protect society from these events, um, but also how difficult it is. 90% 90, 90 of our companies fail and 90% of their projects fail. Uh, and yet, even with that, you know, sort of relatively dismal success rate, they have to attract investors, knowing and those investors knowing that they'll lose their shirts nine out of ten times. And this is hard enough, just in the regular realm of of, of medicines that are purchased by the healthcare system. But it's particularly uh, daunting when we're talking about these kinds of products, which are essentially only purchased, um, well, for the most part, by the federal government. And so their uh, ability to have some certainty as to what it is the government wants them to innovate, and then uh, how much help they're going to have in that process uh, in terms of finances and the bureaucratic procedures, and then the certainty that these measures will actually be acquired um, by the government all lead to the ability and the willingness of investors to, to make, make, make that take that risk. Um, what we haven't spent a lot of time talking about is the diagnostic side of it. How do we, we have these measures at, uh, at the ready, uh, hopefully, how quickly can we in fact diagnose uh, what we're looking at, whether it's on the battlefield, whether it's uh, in hospitals when people all of a sudden unexpectedly arrive, when it's some catastrophic event out in, the, in, in society. And so we're very much interested in um, looking into that and how those those challenges um, will affect the diagnostics manufacturers as well as they do the the um, the, uh, the the countermeasures. And so um, we're very much looking forward to ex officio members uh, George Post's uh, uh, comments and testimony on this, and also um, uh, looking forward to hearing from uh, Dr. Jeffrey Ling, who's the founding director of uh, the DOD Biological Technologies Office, um, eager to hear his experiences and discuss where much needed innovations can help medical countermeasure and diagnostics development. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Jim Weinstein, former Homeland Security Advisor. Ken. Ken, excuse me. And I'll be Jim Greenwood. Greenwood, uh, he just so mesmerized me that I couldn't get his name out of my mind. <laughs> I'll answer to anything. Okay. Uh, good morning, and uh, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I actually, I, uh, these meetings are a highlight of my calendar whenever I look forward just uh, down the, the road to the calendar. Oh, thank you. Um, this is why you have a senator next to you to teach you the ropes. <laughs> Turn on the button. Um, but I look forward to these whenever I see them on the calendar because they're, they're fascinating. But I particularly for, look forward to them when we have a day like today where we're able to mark some seeming progress, um, uh, some movement ahead. And I, talking about the, the strategy, the national strategy that we're going to hear about today, I want to compliment the White House, compliment Tim and Hillary Carter, who is a driving force behind that strategy. Uh, they're both here today. So thank you for your leadership and thank you for um, putting the strategy out. Um, and also just thank you for your presence here today. One of the sort of underlying tenets of our, our report, our blueprint, was that this, the biodefense um, effort requires leadership, and it requires some centralized leadership because the current situation is sort of too diffused, the responsibilities and accountability is diffused across the federal bureaucracy, fractionated among the different departments and agencies. Um, and as a result, the only way we're actually going to corral those responsibilities and focus accountability and make progress is if there's real leadership um, from the White House. And your presence here today and the good work you've done the strategies demonstrating that that's, that's coming through. The one thing I, I want to mention about today is, um, you know, this biodefense is going to take, require focus on all aspects from prevention to recovery to mitigation. Um, but my, I'm particularly interested in talking today about the intelligence um, efforts that we're going to be undertaking to try to 
detect the, the threats, um, anticipate them, neutralize them, and the, and, and the like. As you know, in our blueprint for biodefense, one of our recommendations was focused on the intelligence community and intelligence efforts. We talked about the need for a, a national intelligence or biodefense manager. Um, we talked about the need to make sure that people are identified throughout the bureaucracy, um, White House, departments and agencies who own the biodefense responsibility. And we talked about resources and, uh, and prioritization. So I think that's something I'm looking forward to talking to, uh, talking with the, um, the experts who are going to be here today. And we have some very good experts. We have Kathleen Riley from the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. We'll be talking about the intelligence effort from her perspective. Dr. Duncan McGill uh, will be here. Um, and we also have Larry Kerr, who's with HHS now, but used to be on the National Security staff and ODNI. And in fact, one of the strategies we reviewed when we were developing the, the blueprint for biodefense was a strategy that he wrote. So I'm looking forward to talking to them about um, how the strategy is going to translate into um, step or many steps forward in the intelligence realm. Thank you, Ken. <laughs> Governor, uh, Thank you. you have the honor to introduce the first witness. Well, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce our, our first panel of one, uh, Attorney Tim Morrison. Uh, Tim joined the National Security Council in July of this past year. He serves uh, as the Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Weapons of Mass Destruction and Biodefense. Obviously, that portfolio uh, covers uh, all WMD agents, chemical, bio, nuclear, radiological. He's also involved in, uh, particularly involved in strengthening our country's efforts against biological threats. And to that end, if you don't mind, uh, Tim, I, I want uh, Dr. Hillary Carter to stand up and be recognized to the audience. Uh, Dr. Carter. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Carter is the director of, uh, for countering biological threats for the National Security Council. Dr. Carter's got an incredible background uh, education and research, or State Department, domestic and overseas responsibilities. And I think uh, Tim would probably say nobody was more more influential in putting together this uh, strategy about which you're going to testify than Dr. Carter. So on behalf of the panel, we extend our gratitude. And by the way, she is a Pennsylvanian. <laughs> so I just thought I'd throw that out there. Once a gov, always a gov. Thank you, Dr. Carter. Um, so before, before uh, uh, Attorney Morrison took on this responsibility, he had staff positions up on the Hill, both the House and the Senate, but he, he uh, left as policy director of the uh, Armed Services Committee of the House. In addition to that role in public service, he wears another uniform from time to time in the United States Naval Reserve. So uh, Tim Morrison, on behalf of the uh, panel, welcome. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Governor, uh, Senator Lieberman, Senator Daschle, uh, Mr. Weinstein, uh, Congressman Greenwood, and the rest of the panel. Um, I would especially like to thank you for singling out uh, Dr. Carter. Um, Hillary is one of the uh, countless uh, civil servants uh, that uh, rarely receives enough attention for her service, but uh, we would not, I would not be here today. We would not be here with, uh, with a national biodefense strategy without uh, countless hours of work from people like Hillary. So thank you very much for singling her out. Um, as a matter of uh, personal privilege, I spent a number of years on the Hill, as you outlined, and uh, many, many hours in meetings with uh, Senator Lieberman. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a special privilege for me to be here today, sir. Uh, I hope you'll go easy on me. Um, but <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, some things never change, sir. Uh, so uh, thank, thank you, sir. So um, we're, we're here today. I want to thank the, the Blue Ribbon Study Panel um, for, for your work. Uh, there's, there's an old saying that we, we stand on the shoulders of giants and we can see farther. And I think that's the case here because the uh, work that the administration did on the biodefense strategy and the National Security Presidential Memorandum was very much informed by your work. Uh, when, I, when I arrived in the office um, in July uh, and uh, began getting briefed by people like Hillary about the biodefense strategy, one of the first things that got stuck in my hand was your report. Um, and I, I had the same question um, uh, that you all uh, have asked, and that's there was a direction in FY17 to do a report. What took so long? And I think for our purposes, we took a look at the direction that came from the Congress in the 17 NDAA and we saw 
a direction to look at how HHS, DHS, DOD, and USDA um, are, are working in the biodefense uh, space and give us a strategy. And we actually stepped back um, and we said, what we're actually looking at here is a whole of government problem. We have 15 departments and agencies. We have uh, the agencies of the intelligence community, all of which play a role in biodefense. So why don't we harness everything that they do um, to protect, figure out how to protect the country uh, from uh, accidental, from man-made, from biological events. And it, it happened that we, we came with the biodefense strategy in the NSPM 17 years to the day that a letter was sent to Senator Daschle, um, uh, the anthrax attacks that, that had a, a great impact on, on, our, on our government, um, and in the centenary year of the great influenza pandemic, a pandemic that killed 50 million people in, a, in an era before air travel, uh, in an era where, where soldiers were brought back from, uh, from the, the war fields of Europe, and we're just here on the, the practically the 100th anniversary of, of the armistice. But one of the reasons that that pandemic spread as rapidly is we had, we had soldiers uh, from, from around the world um, traveling by steamship, traveling by train, and one steps back, one asks oneself what would happen in an era of, of global aviation, the likes of which we have today. I myself just got back from, from Rome uh, yesterday by way of Frankfurt uh, and came into contact with countless uh, people, um, uh, all of whom could pose a risk for our economy, for our national security. And so these are the kinds of uh, issues that we took a look at when framing the national uh, biodefense strategy. And so when the president signed his NSPM, I think he took a look at the 15 departments and agencies, the intelligence community, and he also took a look at the examples uh, presented by the Bush administration uh, and the Obama administration and said, okay, how do we, how do we go further? Um, what do we need to do to really build on the, the examples of um, the prior administration's efforts, but also what we've learned since then from Ebola in 2014? What we learned from Ebola in 2016? What we learned from Zika and MERS and SARS and anthrax? Um, how do we take a, a step to really build on uh, the kinds of challenges that the Blue Ribbon Panel uh, highlights? And so he set about a strategy that for the first time uh, presents a leader on biodefense across the federal government, and that's the Secretary of HHS. The Secretary will be essentially the first among equals um, uh, among the uh, heads of the departments and agencies uh, chairing a biodefense steering committee uh, to harness all the activities of the federal government um, in the biodefense space. But he will also be the official um, charge with coordinating the range of activities that include uh, the state and local uh, sector. That include uh, the private sector. Uh, if you'll look at the biodefense strategy, I think one of the things that we're particularly proud of uh, that we, we believe sets it apart from some of the prior uh, work is the reliance on innovation, the reliance of engaging the private sector uh, to harness what technology can do to help us deal with biodefense challenges. So we have a, a senior federal official, the Secretary of HHS, we also have my boss, the Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs, the National Security Advisor, who will take the product of the Biodefense Steering Committee um, and uh, lead a process in the interagency to assess our capabilities and prioritize biodefense actions across the U.S. government. This annual prioritization process will determine the biodefense priorities for the government and also link it to the annual budget cycle for the first time. Um, that, frankly, is, I think, where we feel we will need help. We will need to help um, our partners uh, in the private sector, our partners in the Congress, understand that they play a role in biodefense uh, that perhaps they've never previously understood. Our definition of success, I think, is very much predicated on the idea if the American people never have to think about biodefense, we've succeeded. We do not want a scenario where the American people have to think about another global pandemic, uh, uh, influenza pandemic, along the lines of, of what their, their grandparents and great-grandparents had to think about in 1918. And so this process that will be led by the Secretary of HHS and the National Security Advisor has five key goals. Assess biological risks, ensure capabilities to prevent biological incidents, prepare to reduce the impacts of biological incidents, respond rapidly to biological incidents, and recover after biological incidents. And I think it's important when we talk about biological incidents, we are thinking about whether or not they are um, they are uh, man-made, they are accidental, or whether or not these are th uh, threats that naturally arise from Mother Nature. 
Um, but what they all have in common is even in the most remote places of the world, they could spread rapidly and directly impact our citizens' health, security, and their prosperity. And that's what the biodefense strategy is, is seeking to accomplish. What, what we're looking at um, is very much informed by accountability. It is we, the NSPM that the president signed uh, assigns roles, responsibilities, defines end states, milestones, uh, and metrics for the implementation of the strategy. Um, and I'd like to talk to you a little bit about how we're uh, pursuing those end states, milestones, and metrics. How we are looking at end states, these are, we are defining what success looks like for each sub-objective of the biodefense strategy and the NSPM. Our milestones are time-bound actions that will be taken to achieve each end state milestones and are resource informed, but not necessarily resource bound. And our metrics are indicators that will tell us when we are meeting the milestones. And I think the first opportunity for the Blue Ribbon Study Panel to evaluate our success will come um, in January, February, when we meet the 120 day um, implementation uh, deadline provided to us by the NSPM. That will be the president's first opportunity to grade us. That'll be your first opportunity to grade us as to how we are uh, implementing the implementation plan. Uh, to, uh, in response to the NSPM. And I think what I'd like to close with is uh, a reflection that the administration is attempting to change the government's approach to complex biological threats. For the first time, we will be evaluating national biodefense needs and monitoring government-wide implementation of the biodefense strategy on an ongoing basis. The Secretary of HHS, the National Security Advisor will owe the President annual homework to evaluate the priorities that the biodefense enterprise, the 15 departments and agencies, the intelligence community uh, are currently actioning and what the priorities should be based on intelligence, based on innovation, based on the economy, and based on the vote that is, posed, that is given to us by man-made threats, accidental threats, uh, and biological threats. And so that annual assessment and prioritization process will help to ensure that the administration stays nimble and can counter rapidly evolving biological threats. Execution of the biodefense strategy, we hope, will result in a more efficient, coordinated, and accountable biodefense enterprise. But as I, I said at the outset, our work was chartered by Congress. It was prioritized by the President based on his thinking on biodefense going back to, to 2000. Um, but it was really, I think, truly informed by the biodefense, uh, by the Blue Ribbon Study Panel on biodefense. And I think we're very much uh, hoping that this dialogue that we have today, this dialogue that uh, people like Hillary uh, participated in in the development of the biodefense strategy and the development of the NSBM will continue so we can figure out where are we uh, are we succeeding in implementing the president's direction and where do we need to do a little bit more work and and frankly how do you, how can we work better with our partners whether those partners are at the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue whether those partners are the state and local actors or those partners are the private sector uh, and so with that, I think uh, far more interesting than my comments will be your questions and, and hopefully my ability to answer them. Uh, thanks uh, very much, Director Morrison. If it's okay, I'll begin, and uh, then we'll, we'll each take a turn. Um, let, me, let me ask you this. Uh, those of us who are here know how real the biological threat is, but it, but it may be that uh, others... Um, Th think it's largely theoretical. So ju just talk for a minute about um, what's on your uh, screen now that's happening. Uh, I know you mentioned when we met briefly earlier about Ebola in the Congo. Um, there are also some evidence, obviously, recently publicly uh, known about the use of rice. And uh, just, just give us a kind of uh, status report on, on why this is real to you and the position you're in now. Thank you, Senator. I think um, I'm going to just pick Ebola because that's the one that I know I can I can talk about uh, without going to prison for leaking classified information. Um, <laughs> so um, Ebola, I think, is something that we've been dealing with since since 2014. The Obama administration uh, came and, and dealt with a significant Ebola uh, epidemic, uh, and there was not a great deal um, that they had available to them. There wasn't a lot on the pantry uh, shelf. And, and the situation we find ourselves in, based on the good work that they did at the time and dealing with a very um, aggressive um, outbreak, uh, helped to set us up where earlier this year when we dealt with Ebola in the Congo and, and now as we deal with Ebola in the Congo, we have, um, we have tools that the prior administration didn't have. 
Um, we, we are unfortunately, um, while one of those tools um, is a, a vaccine that the prior administration didn't have, uh, thankfully we're dealing with an epidemic that deals with uh, a, a particular strain of Ebola for which we have a vaccine. Um, we are also dealing with an Ebola epidemic in a particularly troubled part of the Congo, uh, where there is a very active uh, terrorist presence and um, a very destabilized security situation. Uh, and so the administration has been leading a fairly aggressive interagency process to bring together the assets that we have uh, while constrained by the security situation that we are presented with in, in the Eastern DRC um, that, uh, you know, I, I wish I could say we, we had, um, we had a, a more progress to report, but I think we would be in a far worse place today without um, the work done by the prior administration, the work done by the private sector to develop a vaccine, um, and the kinds of intensive leadership focus that we were f that we, we put on the biodefense uh, problem set through uh, the development of the NSPM and the development of the national biodefense strategy. Um, there are uh, several other uh, threat vectors you alluded to that I, I think I'll, I'll probably just um, demure on, and, and maybe when we talk again at the 120-day uh, implementation timeline, there'll be more I can say about uh, some other threat factors. But take uh, the Ebola situation in the uh, Congo. Um, so how would you describe our goal there? I mean, I, that may seem very far away to people. Is it to uh, uh, try to treat people with Ebola there so it doesn't come here? Is it, so talk a little bit about what our Yes, sir. National interest is in being involved there. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, in fact, uh, we we talk we we're talking uh, we are talking today about the national biodefense strategy. But I would I, I'm remiss, in fact, in not pointing out that the national security strategy that the president uh, issued in December of last year um, actually prioritizes counter countering biological threats. And the president in that strategy told us that our our primary goal with uh, with respect to uh, countering biological threats is to counter them at their source. Right. So. Um, a, from a humanitarian uh, perspective, we want to deal with uh, an epidemic um, that causes considerable su uh, suffering uh, and, and, and generally destabilizes a security situation in a country. But the, under the national security strategy, one of the things that we are very much mindful of was we want to deal with that there. We don't want to have to deal with Ebola here. So that is one of our primary um, uh, con op, so to speak, if I can borrow uh, from some military jargon. Uh, we want to deal with these with these things uh, at their source. We don't want to have to deal with them at our borders. Um, and so because we have a vaccine, because we have a very robust effort through CDC, uh, very robust partnerships with the WHO, um, we are dealing with that threat there, but uh, the security situation gets a vote, and so we are, we are struggling to contain uh, that, that particular outbreak. Okay, I'll just make a, a comment about one, one uh, matter you've talked about and then ask you a final question. The comment is about uh, accountability, and I appreciate the statement you made in opening. Um, we just found so many areas of the federal government that were involved in biodefense, and they were not coordinated. There wasn't even a clear sense of a, what the budget was, how much we were spending every year. We recommended, as you know, in our report that the vice president be put in charge of this. To, to a certain extent, I, I, I believe you understand that we backed into that, that we couldn't um, uh, find anybody else. And we were, we were really skeptical of having um, one department uh, person, one department secretary, even Secretary Azar, now as you've chosen. No, there's no reflection on him. We didn't know who that was going to be at the time we put our report out. Because it, it's sometimes hard to be first among equals. Um, but I understand the decision you've made, particularly uh, having uh, the National Security Advisor, who does have that government-wide um, range and access to the president and vice president uh, responsibilities. So, you know, I wish you well on it. I hope it works, and, and um, we'll, we'll just want to keep in touch with you on it. The, the, the question I have uh, is about um, BioWatch. Um, the whole idea going way back, and this really came from our experience uh, during the anthrax events of 2001, um, when, we, when we couldn't adequately detect or track potential or realized uh, biological threats. Uh, those uh, BioWatch detectors were supposed to be deployed, as you know, to major metropolitan areas and large mass gatherings to rapidly capture, identify, and transmit uh, pathogen data 
uh, to federal and uh, other officials. Uh, in our opinion, as we expressed it in the report, uh, it's just never lived up uh, to those uh, expectations. And we're not alone. I mean, GAO conducted a review of the system, found that they actually could not determine the effectiveness of the program and that the Department of Homeland Security had never really developed requirements for the performance of the technology. So this, this could leave, leave us, probably would leave us, much more exposed to an attack for a longer period of time when we would know it was out there than really we should allow to continue. So our, our recommendation uh, was really to either get, well, basically to come up with a new program, either to dramatically improve BioWatch, if that's possible, or, or to come up with a new program. And we particularly pointed to information we had, which was public, that the Department of Defense uh, was developing uh, biodetection systems that sounded to us like they were much more effective than BioWatch. So I, I'm just I'm, I'm asking for a report on um, whether this is a priority for you and and how, uh, what, what what you hope will happen here. Sir, if I if I could, um, I'd, I'd rather not comment on a specific program at this time. And I know you mentioned you have Assistant Secretary McDonald, but I think yes. what I would like to just say is. I think this is why we, we settled upon the approach that we did. What we're looking to do um, is through the HHS-led uh, Biodefense Steering Committee and through the National Security Advisor-led uh, prioritization process um, and the role that prioritization process will play with um, uh, OMB on the annual budget uh, review, I think what we're hoping to do, to do is take a look at all of the biodefense efforts across uh, the 15 departments and agencies in the IC, figure out what's working, uh, figure out what isn't working, figure out how priorities have changed since last year, since the year before, since ye the year various programs have started, so that we can be more responsive to how biodefense is changing, uh, be more responsive to the president's priority on biodefense. Um, and that's these programs that have uh, developed across the interagency, we intend to look at everything we're doing um, on a year-by-year -year basis to make sure that, that the investments the taxpayers are, are, are making um, uh, are as effective as possible. And so um, I'm going to go for a slightly more generalized uh, answer to your question. Um, I know you've got Assistant Secretary McDonnell, and, and again, uh, I look forward to the opportunity to coming back to talk to you a little bit more about how we're, how we're implementing. Um, and once we get the budget um, uh, for FY20, for example, we'll, we'll uh, have more we can say about how the President has chosen to prioritize uh, biodefense above and below the line. Good enough. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Senator. Uh, a quick observation, if I might, and then uh, one question to move along. Uh, I just want to put an exclamation point on BioWatch. It hasn't worked, isn't working, can't be re remedied. This is a system that was put in place shortly after 9-11. Maybe there have been modest improvements. Old technology, labor intensive. Uh, and for years, those have been involved, and there can't be any higher priority than detecting. And so it's, and it's, it's, it's just, I'm not uh, in any means uh, interpret this as being critical of your response. I think it's a very thoughtful approach you're taking to everything including BioWatch, but I just think you should know, and I think I speak for, well, I'll speak for myself, I think it's outlived its usefulness, and there can't be anything more important. Before you can deal with it, you got to detect it, and uh, uh, i got to believe in your heart and the doctor's uh, uh, heart that the detection has got to be a high priority, so I'll just do that. You have uh, in this uh, terrific document um, embedded uh, 24 of our recommendations for which we're grateful. Uh, you have uh, the secretaries are and presumably uh, uh, John Bolton, National Security Advisor, uh, joined at the hip overseeing the implementation of the strategy. And that's a, uh, it's not our recommendation, but it's an area, it's, it's a point of accountability and contact. And that's really important. I guess the question I have is, will the secretary with uh, John Bolton or Secretary give specific written directions to the appropriate agencies or cabinet members or sub-members to see to it that those specific recommendations that are generically pulled into the strategy, that there's an outcome associated uh, with each one. I mean, uh, we put very specific recommendations. You've embedded some in the report. We're glad they're referenced. 
will there be some formal way to direct the requisite uh, groups and subgroups to implement them? Uh, sir, maybe what I could do is I could um, walk you through what our next 12 months look like. Um, I think this might answer your question. Uh, so January 2019, uh, roles, responsibilities, milestones, metrics, end states developed and approved by deputies. Uh, 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 Biodefense uh, coordination team was formed in December uh, of this year. January 2019, HHS uh, will issue a request to all departments and agencies requesting information on their biodefense programs. March, biodefense memoranda due to the Bi biodefense coordination team. 29, June 2019, biodefense assessment due to the National Security Advisor and the OMB Director. Summer 2019, uh, joint policy guidance developed and issued. Uh, September 2019, public report released, uh, an opportunity for the public to, to hold us accountable as the President surely will. Um, September 2019, department and agency budget requests due to OMB as well as the response memos to the policy guidance. What, what, I'm, what I'm trying to convey is the, um, the, the fairly robust process that we are using for the lines of effort that were in the strategy, for the lines of effort in the NSPM, um, who is responsible and what progress uh, we're making. So we can provide that up to the president and we can provide that to the public um, so that both uh, the Congress that will have to um, give us the, the funding needed to execute these biodefense priorities um, knows what it is that we're doing. Uh, the Congress knows what it is that we're doing. Uh, the Blue Ribbon Panel will be able to help us um, the course correct as needed. Um, but uh, w I think we have a fairly uh, robust process for um, accountability uh, so that uh, these are not just words on a page, that this is a process that the president can come back and say, so what, what's being done to implement something that um, uh, one of the things I, I found when I came in, this is, this is something that he's been thinking about since, since the year 2000. Uh, this is something that's been with the president for a while um, and he's, he's personally motivated on. Does, does that help, sir? Very encouraging response. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Senator Daschle. Well, let me just start by, uh, again, associating myself with Governor Ridge's remarks on BioWatch. I, I remember getting briefed on BioWatch uh, a long, long time ago. I was in the Senate, and uh, anthrax had occurred, of course, and I had such high expectations, and I must say I'm very disappointed with what has happened since, and I... I uh, I think detection is so critical, and I just don't think we're we're anywhere close to where we need to be. And BioWatch has been sort of our cover. Um, we could always point to BioWatch, and that was our cover. But that cover is getting very flimsy, and it's it's not certainly no reflection at all on this administration. You've inherited a lot of these programs, and I'm just uh, one of uh, of the panel. But I too would really want to see uh, how we might make uh, a new program on detection more effective. I, I, I would just, uh, I, and I, I also was encouraged by your response with regard to delegating roles and responsibilities. Are you concerned at all that a peer agency is going to be coordinating this effort uh, with other peer groups and, and, and departments? I mean, I, I, I worry a little bit about authority and whether that delegated authority is going to be clear enough. I, I think it's so critical that we have the clarity around roles, responsibilities, and deadlines. And it would seem to me, just inherently in any bureaucracy, that that enforcing those roles and that that series of deadlines is really going to be a challenge. How confident are you that we can do that? Sir, I mean, I think from our perspective, this is one of the, the reasons that we were uh, pleased that the president decided to give us an NSPM. Um, at this point, it's not just a strategy document that we write, we, we sit on a shelf somewhere. The, the president has given us his direction for how he wants us to undertake uh, this. And for my brief time in the executive branch, when the president tells you clearly what he wants you to do, that's, um, you know, you just you just don't get more. Um, than that from the perspective of working the bureaucracy and working the executive branch. So w what, we, what we tried to do here was we tried to set up um, a, a process that uh, while we're, we're very fortunate to have uh, uh, people like uh, Secretary Azar, people like Assistant Secretary Cadillac, uh, Assistant Secretary McDonnell, um, I saw earlier, these are, these are experts in their field. Um, 
but you can't build it just around the people. You have to build a system that can that can uh, that can persist and survive beyond individual personalities. And, and I think that's the advantage of the approach we've settled on with the Secretary of HHS, with uh, the National Security Advisor, Advisor reporting up to the President, who has given us clear direction. Um, uh, President Trump is, uh, as, as, as most uh, would, would say, is uh, he, he, he lets us know very clearly and directly what his expectations are, and then he's uh, not shy about holding us uh, accountable to them. Great. You mentioned NSPM uh, several times now. Let me just ask one uh, more of a technical question. Uh, uh, the, uh, the NSPM accompanied the, uh, obviously, the, 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 the national strategy. And I made a, a number of recommendations. Uh, the national strategy for countering biological threats and the national policy for biodefense uh, were uh, actually rescinded um, two previous presidential policies. But other relevant biodefense uh, directives, such as the defense of the United States Agriculture and Food uh, Program, and uh, 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 that and uh, uh, there were, were some that, that, that were, were not rescinded. How did you make the decision between those that would be kept and those that would be rescinded? So I, I think uh, for the NSPD uh, and the PPD uh, from the prior administrations, um, we took a look at what they did. There was a lot of good in there that I think we kept. There was, uh, but also a lot that we built upon, especially the accountability. Um, and one of the things that uh, we wanted to make sure is that um, it's clear that the Secretary uh, of Agriculture has uh, expertise in protecting um, what is a significant uh, biodefense uh, threat factor, and that's our food system. So we didn't need to go in and we didn't need to tamper with that. We needed to harness it and put it into the interagency uh, process uh, and make sure that uh, the priorita prioritization there could be um, included in the prioritization we'd be doing across the uh, 15 departments and agencies in the intelligence community. Um, but where we began, began to be concerned about the possibility of inconsistent direction would be if we kept that NSPD and we kept that PPD on the books. Um, so that's why we wanted to repeal them when we issued the NSPM to make clear that this was the, this was the direction that departments and agencies have to be uh, following now in terms of how we would review biodefense across the, the federal government because this is how the president will be holding them accountable. So we, we really just wanted to make clear what the processes would be and not have inconsistent directions still on the book, so to speak. Um, but how the Department of Agriculture deals with um, a particular idiosyncratic problem that it has, like uh, like food security, the security of the agriculture sector, um, that would be uh, something that they would bring to the table in the Biodefense uh, Coordinating Committee and the Steering Committee. Um, and that would obviously be something that uh, we would look at in the annual prioritization process. So it'll be annually reviewed? E everything. Uh, everything will be annually reviewed. The, the, the document is clear, and I think the departments and agencies are, are very well understand that everything um, is reviewed under the President's direction uh, in the NSPM. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Jim. Thanks, Joe. So just segue from the annual review. Um, thinking about um, imagining us all sitting here a year from now and uh, trying and asking you in what ways is America safer now than it was when we met on this date. Uh, you have a, we have a new strategy, we have new structures, we have new players uh, and as we all know those of us who have served in government, it's all of us a very long time, um, it's so easy to lose momentum because we start assessing things that have been assessed, we start thinking about things that have already been thought about um, and and it's it's hard to move a bureaucracy. And so um, give us your thinking about what, what you see happening in the course of the next 12 months that would um, move, you know, instead of reinventing wheels, move wheels forward measurably so we can sit here a year from now and say, in these ways, America is measurably safer than it was a year ago. So we, we don't know what we don't know. We don't know... Um, where we're going to be with a particular problem set like Ebola. Um, we don't know, uh, will, will Mother Nature surprise us with um, influenza? Will Mother Nature uh, surprise us with, with something else? Will there be a, a non-state actor that, um, that surprises us? Um, I think what we do know is 
uh, because of the NSPM, we'll be in a better situation to understand um, uh, who is accountable, who the president can go to in a particular uh, threat scenario. And I think we'll be in a better uh, position to understand um, all of the tools that we have at, uh, to bring to the to bring to bear on the problem set. I think we'll be in a better position than we were in, for example, in 2014, uh, when the prior administration was was faced with Ebola, and and didn't know what it had available. It didn't know what it could bring to the table. It didn't have all the relationships with the private sector and the the vaccine manufacturers that it wound up um, uh, calling upon, and it wound up uh, building that sort of muscle memory for us that we could call upon. So, so hopefully what will be in a situation uh, to report back in a year is that Mother Nature has been quiet, the non-state actors have been quiet, and we've been in a, um, a, a place that we can um, turn the crank on this process, uh, this machine that we've created per the president's direction uh, to better prioritize the things that are working, deprioritize or replace the things that aren't. And I'd like to come back in a year and show you what some of those things are. Um, uh, but that, that's, I think, how we're, we're, we're hoping. Um, I wouldn't say, maybe I should have caught myself, I don't think we're naive that Mother Nature is going to give us that break. Uh, we, she, she's not giving us that break today in the DRC. Um, but we know more about biodefense today than we knew uh, before we started this process, and we know more than we knew in 2014. We know more than we knew in 2001, uh, to be sure. Um, so, so that's what I'm, that's what I'm hoping uh, we'll be able to do uh, with uh, a year of operating in this process, um, and and again having that clear accountability where if if somebody uh, comes in and, and wants their their playground left to themselves, they want their their programs left to themselves, um, it's pretty clear under the NSPM that that's not the way the president wants it. I appreciate that, and I my po point was not to anticipate what's going to happen. Obviously, we can't do that. But just just to emphasize that there is always a tendency, a tendency to for people to say, well, let's wipe the slate clean and let's start from scratch and let's start rethinking. When, when so much has already been done, it's really a question of building momentum on what we already know than it is gathering new information about what the threats are. And I think what we're looking to do is get our arms around what, what's working, what isn't. Um, and how the priorities change because of, of that, that man-made space, that, that accidental space, that biological space, how that emerges year by year by year um, so that we can, we can build on what works and we can deprioritize what isn't. Uh, thank you, Jim. Ken. Thanks. Um, I'll apologize in advance, Tim, but I'm going to beat a dead horse here a little bit about the centralized leadership. So um, as you recall, we recommended and as um, Senator Lieberman, Lieberman explained, um, we recommended that the leadership of this across government effort be housed in the office of the vice president. And that really, really was sort of less a sort of particular um, gravitation toward the vice president and more a recognition that this needed to be run out of the White House, that that's the only way that we're really going to sort of corral all the elements of the government and focus them on a single objective. Uh, and then we had a uh, biodefense, um, what was it, coordination council we recommended that, that the vice president would chair. So you all have the secretary, secretary is our, and you have the steering committee, the biodefense steering committee, which is so roughly the same, I guess, as the, the coordination council we recommended. So I guess the question for me is when the rubber hits the road and the inevitable happens where, you know, Secretary Azar, you know, despite his best efforts, can't get maybe one of the constituent agencies or departments to do whatever's necessary for the mission. Often that will mean ceding responsibility for something, um, and that can't happen. How does that then get translated into the White House coming down and saying this has got to happen? Because, you know, the usual paradigm is you have the National Security Advisor or the Homeland Security Advisor. Yeah. That person gets regular reports, has principals meetings, and everybody sort of gets in line because the president is sort of directly answerable. How is this going to work where you, you – I understand that um, the National Security Advisor is, you know, held accountable and his job is to, to hold people accountable, but how does that actually happen in practice? That's my concern. Well, so I think that's where the, um, the, the problems that you uh, identify uh, where um, – the Biodefense Steering Committee, led by the Secretary, will uh, survey the biodefense uh, activities across uh, the departments and agencies across the intelligence community 
uh, they will uh, produce a report and then it's left to the White House. It's left to the National Security Advisor to coordinate the interagency. And so we, we do this, uh, as you well know, sir, uh, every day. Um, the goal is to find consensus, but where consensus um, isn't found, the, the, the policy process um, looks to that. And ultimately we have uh, here the, the president's interest. So where there's not a consensus, um, we've done the work, we've looked at uh, who's right, um, uh, maybe who's got a perspective that um, is missing what is the higher priority uh, and set that up for the president to decide. So through the NSPM, ultimately, the, the president will be in a position to hold the secretary and hold the National Security Advisor accountable for, uh, for why priorities haven't been uh, addressed, for why um, uh, there's there's disagreement um, and consensus wasn't reached in doing that annual evaluation of the of the priorities uh, and the threats uh, based on the work that's been done in the HHS led process to uh, examine everything that the federal government is doing in the biodefense space each year. Okay, so is the steering committee sort of going to take the place of the like the PCC deputies process? It would just go straight up. From no, I, no, I think the, the steering committee will um, will inform the, the PCC and the DC process um, to give us the, the data on uh, what's being done, what the what the priorities are, and uh, where there's disagreement about whether something falls above or below the line. Um, and um, housing that in the, the White House under the National Security Advisor um, gives us a process that that has worked pretty well um, and that the interagency knows how to do um, across administrations. Okay. And then um, one related question is, uh, so I know Homeland Security Advisor uh, Admiral Fears, is, is he going to be involved in this? I, I, absolutely, sir. Okay. Good. Uh, Director Morrison, uh, I get a kick out of adding that title to your name, Tim. Uh, thanks very much for being here. Uh, I'm sure we all have a lot more questions. But I know you've got to get back to the White House, and we've got a, a really full group of witnesses that we're going to hear during the remainder of the day. We're already over our schedule. So I, I'm going to consider this what I know you are, the beginning of a, of a dialogue between us, maybe even the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Who knows? <laughs> you, or in our case, a continuation of one that began uh, in the Senate. But uh, thank you. You've been very responsive. I couldn't help but think as I, as I listen to you, and I know I'm sure you think of this every day and maybe sometimes at night, um, you, you, the position, the responsibility you have is, um, well, it's invisible to the public. We're, we're focused on it because we have an interest in biodefense. But uh, God forbid there's an event, um, or uh, even take the, the fear of the Ebola outbreak, which thank God didn't go very far here, the, the Klieg lights of the modern media will um, um, just focus in on you and all you're doing. So I appreciate all you're doing uh, preemptively, and uh, we, we want to be your uh, allies in that work. Thank you very much for Thank coming you over. Thank time and your leadership, sir. See you soon. Thank you. Here, here. That never happened when you were in the Senate. You never got a round of applause. <laughs> okay. So uh, second uh, panel, uh, Dr. Ann Shuckett, uh, uh, James McDonald, and uh, Catherine Godfrey. Dr. Shuckett is the principal deputy director and former acting director of the Centers for Disease uh, Control and Prevention. She recently retired from the um, U.S. Public Health Service at the rank of Rear uh, Admiral. James McDonald uh, is the first Assistant Secretary for the CWMD Office at uh, DHS, which operates both the BioWatch program and the National Biosurveillance Integration Center, NBIC, which we've uh, already referred to in part. Uh, before the creation of the CWMD Office, Last year, Mr. McDonald served as the director uh, at DHS of the uh, Domestic Nuclear Detection Office, DNDO. And uh, Catherine Godfrey is an assistant uh, director at GAO. It's great to be back working with GAO, which was always of such great help to us uh, in Congress, uh, has been involved in uh, GAO's work examining federal biosurveillance programs, including NBIC and 
uh, by a watch. Um, I think we've got it organized. Thank you all for being here very much. I think we've got it organized. That Dr. Shukert, we'll start with you. We'll hear all three of you, and then we'll go to questions. If that's it. Uh, Mr. McDonald, I want to thank you. I know you rearranged your schedule so you could uh, stick with us uh, for the duration, and I hope you don't regret that decision. <laughs> okay. I know you won't. <laughs> I know. <laughs> right. Okay. Thank you, Shukert. Great. Thank, thank you so much for the opportunity to to participate today. It's a real privilege to be here, and I feel a lot of history in front of me. Um, I, I have been at the CDC for 30-plus th years now and have um, experienced many of these um, emergency responses firsthand, and so the need for us to continually strengthen our preparedness, our detection and surveillance is absolutely crucial. And as you've been hearing, CDC is right at the moment responding to Ebola in the Democratic Republic of Congo, responding to a polio-like illness that has emerged in children in America, and um, supporting state and local public health who are at the front lines of the, the wildfires in California. So the topic today is very personal. Um, I want to briefly describe some of the progress that we've made in biosurveillance and detection, increasing the breadth, speed, utility, and depth of our systems, and then um, provide a couple actionable recommendations if there's time. Good. Um, the, uh, the CDC has been busy working, um, as has uh, the rest of Health and Human Services, to strengthen the systems that we have. Um, we have broadened our coverage of um, surveillance using the syndromic surveillance program, which looks at emergency department visits. We now have two-thirds of the emergency department visits in the country under that system. 2.6 million emergency visits a day come into that with essentially real-time visibility of these trends. Um, we've expanded the speed, our mortality data, the death certificates. We have um, pretty much a tenfold increase in the past four years of death certificate data or mortality data that gets to CDC within 10 days of the fatality. Um, we've increased the utility of the data that we um, can access by developing a community of practice around the National Syndromic Surveillance System with visualization and analytic tools that state and local health departments that are part of this can um, access. They can see what's going on in their state and in the neighboring states or others um, and can make decisions based on that data. We've also increased the depth of the information that we collect, and here I want to highlight the laboratory data. As you'll be hearing in, in later panels, there's been a real revolution in the laboratory tools that we um, are able to access. And so what we call advanced molecular detection or using some of the next generation sequencing techniques, we can get a much finer fingerprint around events that are of importance and link them with other events. Um, an example there is our PulseNet system that tracks foodborne diseases that works very closely with the FDA's genome tracker system. This um, transformation from an old laboratory method to this new um, genetic sequencing method is helping us find outbreaks earlier when they are smaller, recall foods or get to the source quicker, and leave um, many um, and, and be able to save lives basically in that uh, arena. Another example of this um, more granular laboratory testing is the influenza system, which of course is critical for detecting unusual viruses that could be the beginning of a new pandemic or um, changes emerging viruses that suggest that our vaccines may not be as effective as we like. We've transitioned to a system that we call sequence first, where instead of using a 50-year-old antigenic testing method, we can do much quicker sequencing that really can pinpoint emerging strains, helping us in more real time develop candidate vaccine viruses that industry then can use to create vaccines. This more um, granular approach to the laboratory detection helps us understand patterns. Another example is really the uh, current Ebola outbreak in uh, East um, DRC versus the 2014-15 outbreak. The laboratory detection in 2014-15 was quite labor intensive. We were helicoptering specimens from the outbreak to where the CDC lab had been set up. 
Um, now, using a, a tool called Gene Expert, there's um, on the ground, close to the action, um, polymerase chain reaction testing that doesn't have all the safety concerns of having to grow up the virus and that can get the answer of this person has Ebola and needs to be isolated much closer to the response teams. So I think in, in summary, there's been a lot of progress in the US and global um, uh, deployment of better detection and better surveillance. And yet we have room for improvement, as is always the case with preparedness. Um, a couple actionable recommendations for your consideration. Just as the laboratory systems have really advanced, the information technology and data systems have also really advanced. And it's critical that the government, and I would just provincially say CDC, be able to um, accelerate the public health system's adoption of newer methods. Um, we have a public health data strategy, and HHS has a full approach to reimagining data that really get the tools of um, more real-time, more um, accurate information to the, the uh, individuals who can take action. So the first um, recommendation is just to um, support, resource, um, implement, accelerate the, um, the full adoption of modern information technology systems, or what I would call timely, more accurate, more accessible data. A second related recommendation is the workforce that can do that. Um, as many in this room know, the, the um, state-of-the-art information technology informatics specialists are high price and precious, and the government cannot always recruit, attract, retain, at, um, uh, incentivize talented individuals to, to come into our ranks. And so um, we, we have an internal priority of, of being able to hire more data scientists, but I think the government in general really needs these 21st century analysts to be deployed for our nation's protection. Um, a third point I would just make is about our laboratory response network. This is the network across the country uh, that um, is used right now to confirm the signals that BioWatch um, uh, uh, alarms, but it's also used for other means like to roll out a new test for the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, the MERS virus, or the Ebola virus, or a new strain of flu. The, the Laboratory Response Network has been a precious tool for the nation's protection under the leadership of CDC and our scientists. And my last recommendation would just be to continue the support for the leadership and coordination of the Laboratory Response Network to be at the CDC, where we have the strong relations with the state and local health departments, and as well the scientific expertise to do that. So thank you for um, my opening remarks. I look forward to the questions. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, that's, to me, uh, a lot of exciting progress you report, so I appreciate it. I'm sure we all have questions for you. Mr. McDonald, thanks for being here. All yours. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Governor Ridge, it's great to see you again. Senator Daschle, thank you. Distinguished members of the panel, thanks for having me. Uh, it's an honor to be here today. Um, I was going to wear a BioWatch hat. I'm glad I didn't. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll discuss that last in my remarks. Uh, the Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction Office was established through an 872 notification to the Congress by Secretary Nielsen. Uh, while the office was created, it does not have the authorities across chem and bio that it does in the nuclear side of things. So as, as CWMD was created through an 872, it was, I, I now oversee the Domestic Nuclear Detection Office and the Office of Health Affairs until Congress does the authorizing language to get that, get that finished. There has been a bill passed in the House to do that. It is on the Senate side now being reviewed and uh, in, within the, the Senate Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee, they've also passed a, a similar bill. So we're hoping to get that through in the next couple of weeks during a lame duck session. And what that will do is allow me to take all of the assets and capabilities that were developed over the years for the nuclear side of the house, which are quite robust, and apply them to the ChemBio pro, uh, programs. So it's not a resource issue, it's an authority and an ability to, to be flexible. So any, any assistance that, that you and your, and your teams can provide in educating members on the criticality of getting that through would be greatly appreciated. Um, so CWMD 
including biodefense as a top priority of this administration. You've, you've heard Tim Morrison talk about that already. The President's national security strategy includes WNB specifically calls out biodefense in Pillar 1. But it, but it doesn't just say biodefense, it says pandemics. So that, that is not left off the table in this. There is the, the biodefense, the sort of national security aspects of it, but then there's a natural occurring diseases and, and a propagation of that. Uh, the president obviously issued national security or uh, biodefense strategy. Um, that is a partnership. I, I can assure you that uh, we are working very closely with, with our partners. Uh, I, I uh, agree with uh, previous comments that some of that is personality dependent as we get going. Uh, Bob Cadillac, who's uh, running the program over at Asper at HHS, he and I worked in the military together. We've been friends for 25 years. So that relationship was really easy to do. Um, our office was created. Uh, the secretary believes that this is a critical mission for the department. So it's my, my responsibility to look across the entire Department of Homeland Security, identify areas that we can leverage to, to do WMD prevention. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. And then significantly, the uh, US Special Operations Command has stood up a CWMD fusion center in the NCR, and it's headed up by a Navy Admiral. Uh, I started doing biodefense in 1993, digging up anthrax in uh, Iraq, using real-time handheld biodetection assays. They were quite expensive at the time. They were custom-made, but technology, as has been mentioned, uh, has advanced. Um, within DHS, I'm in the process of standing up an organizational support bio biosurveillance data integration. Big data is a big part of what we're going to do. So while NBIC was created, it was NBIS, and, and I noticed in your report it still had the S. Uh, so NBIS, the National Biosurveillance Integration System, was set up uh, in, in, in the Infrastructure Protection Office within DHS when I was still there in 2004. Um, limited resources, limited scope, uh, limited ability to pull data, uh, good, good idea, um, sort of really good intentions, really smart people, but never really had the muscle to be able to pull in all the information they needed and share it rapidly. Um, when OHA was created, it was cobbled together by some programs. So BioWatch was one of them at about $80 million a year. NBIC was another one. BioWatch came from the S&T directorate. NBIC came from OHA, uh, excuse me, the, uh, I just mentioned uh, infrastructure protection. And that was pretty much the whole budget those two programs for, for that office. So there was not, over the years, a discretionary budget for them to be able to do much with. Um, I'm not going to defend BioWatch. I'm not here to do that. I think BioWatch does what it was designed to do. But when BioWatch was fielded, we didn't have smartphones. So you know, it's, it looks the same as it did 20 years ago. I was a head of security at Avantrack for a while. And the, the anecdote I like to use on BioWatch is 600,000 people a day go through Penn Station in New York. They connect with a nine million person subway system and within, when, within one hour of four international airports. And the current con op is yesterday somebody released smallpox or some other disease. That to me is unacceptable. So we intend to change that. Uh, virus surveillance is gonna continue to be a critical part of this. Uh, we are leveraging the DHS Big Data Center, which is the CBP's national targeting center. It's been built over the years. It tra literally tracks every container, every commodity, every person moving and coming into the United States. Uh, there is CDC presence, there is USDA presence. Uh, Customs and Border Protection has USDA food ag inspectors at the borders. They are part of my customer set to support. But we wanna know what's moving, where it's moving, where it's emerging. Uh, just to give you an example, the difference on the way we're gonna be looking at bio biosurveillance and integration is I'm assigning about 150 people to be on the information analysis side of, of the WMD mission. So that would be full-time, dispersed around different agencies, embedded in the intelligence community. I just deployed somebody into HHS. Uh, I have somebody at the FBI or DOD. So we're embedding across the organization, and we want to see things as they're emerging and as they're developing, regardless of where they are. Um, we're tracking very closely what's going on in, in the Congo. Uh, there's the uh, we're looking actually we're watching the the movement of the convoy coming or the caravan coming north right what what diseases might be there what what medical issues we may have at the border 
Uh, one thing that's important to note when the office was created that the, the sec current secretary, then chief of staff, thought it was critical to still have a presidentially appointed chief medical officer. We do, and that's to have the gravitas and the expertise for the biodefense mission, to have a doctor who can represent the department at the most senior levels. Um, so I don't need to repeat what's in your uh, report's critique on BioWatch. I will stipulate that uh, what everybody has said is accurate. I'm happy to tell you, though, that we intend to replace BioWatch, and we've already started that process. I've stood up uh, using the DNDO architecture. I've stood up a rapid capabilities office. The U.S. Air Force has detailed a lieutenant colonel to me from their rapid capabilities office to stand the office up. The first project they're doing is called BD-21, Biodetection 21, and that's named based on what was in the panel's recommendation to have a 21st century system. I believe the first equipment will be in the field next month. We have already uh, let contracts. Um, I think Senator Lieberman, men Lieber Lieberman mentioned uh, <laughs> DOD, R&D, um, might have been congressman, but uh, we uh, are doing the contract for BD-21 through the uh, what's called the CWMD Consortium at Aberdeen Proving Grounds with the Army. So the ChemBio program executive up there is who has developed the technology. We're working very closely with them. And in the way, the way a rapid acquisition works, the, the, uh, it's, a, it's a SOCOM type of a model as well, is it has a board of directors. The board of directors, in this case, includes Dr. Cadillac. So he and I sit there and we evaluate whether the guys are buying the right type of equipment, deploying into the right environments. And our plan is to replace BioWatch within the next couple of years, but uh, over the next six to eight months, we will have five different technologies deployed into 12 different locations throughout the United States and be collecting data into the National Targeting Center to do, be able to do big data analytics. We're already working very closely with the DOE laboratories and other big data analytic organizations to help us develop algorithms that will be able to do anomaly detection. Um, the backbone that we're using for that was developed for the nuclear side. So we've, we've been for 20 years deploying nuclear de detection technology. Um, I'm using my nuclear authorities right now to build the backbone for the big data analytics. We've already embedded folks into the targeting center with CBP, and the plan then is to be able to literally plug in the biodetection sensors that will be in the field. The difference is going to be this, this is not a collect a sample, deliver it to CDC, and then do analysis of the sample. It is real-time detection of an anomaly in which then a first responder with appropriate handheld equipment and personal protective gear can go down range and do a quick sample and determine whether there actually is, is a risk there or not. So you take the Penn Station example and you get away from 37 hours before there's a decision to literally in the first 10 or 20 minutes people know something is, is an indicator. It may be wrong, it may not be wrong, but you can have incident management systems set up in the first 20, 30 minutes somebody downrange actually doing a sample and having a presumptive analysis at that point within 30 minutes so people can start making decisions and do incident management. Do you shut down the, the air handling systems? Do you turn off trains? You know, there's some pretty high risk decisions that have to be made, but what we've done is we've put operators in between the, the detector and the laboratory. So just like we do for bomb squads, for hazmat units, that's done all the time. We have, we have tremendous capability in the first responder community out there. But that system will still do a collect, will still collect something that will go to the laboratory following the presumptive analysis. So now incident managers can be sitting there saying, okay, I've got a problem. I'm going to manage it. Now let's send the sample over to the lab and let, let the CDC lab determine exactly what's there so the right decisions can be made on pharmaceutical deployments and other types of public health response. Um, subject to that, sir, I'm happy to take any questions. So uh, thanks. Uh, thank you, too, Secretary McDonald, for a, an encouraging report. And uh, really, we appreciate uh, hearing you say that you intend to replace BioWatch and have some uh, uh, are taking steps right now to do that in a more effective way. I'm sure we'll come back and ask you more about that, but thank you. Ms. Godfrey, thanks for being here. It's like old times for us on the Hill to have somebody from GAO before us. 
Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's, um, it's really great to be here um, talking to the panel. I think as uh, we'll hear in my remarks, GAO's past work has a lot of resonance with the panel's findings. We have followed that with interest and really um, appreciate your work. So GAO has work going back to 2009 on the entire biosurveillance enterprise. Throughout 2009 and into 2010, we conducted a comprehensive review of all of the federal biosurveillance efforts and also noticed the fragmentation, um, how the fragmentation of federal efforts created the conditions under which capability gaps could go undetected, making the nation less prepared. And at the same time, as GAO, uh, we were looking at programs like the National Biosurveillance Integration Center and the BioWatch Center, um, both of which I'll speak more to in a minute. And we noticed how the nebulous architecture and lack of a coherent national vision for both biosurveillance and the larger biodefense enterprise in which it was situated created the risk of inefficient resource use, um, enabling programs that lacked compelling proof of concept, well-defined mission needs, and clearly articulated operational objectives. Um, as a result of that broader work, we recommended a national biosurveillance strategy. Um, and as we know, the White House later published a strategy, um, but this recommendation was never completely fulfilled. Um, as the study panel noted in its follow-up to Recommendation 11, an implementation plan was not published or implemented. Um, and without it, we were not able to find that the strategy as written addressed the concerns both of efficiency and effectiveness that we raised in our report. Um, earlier this year, after eight years of having the open recommendation on the books, we closed it as unimplemented. Um, and we hope to revisit that issue as part of an upcoming review that we have on the new national biosurveillance strategy, which was in um, the NDAA as a mandate for us. Um, and as, as an aside, in 2011, um, based on these same observations of fragmentation, we also called for better leadership and a strategy across the biodefense enterprise in our very first duplication overlap and fragmentation work. Um, and so we uh, have been following and appreciate the, the panel's um, recommendations in that area as well. Um, following the work on the federal biodefense um, programs, we examined the non-federal biodefense capabilities, finding that many of those were funded through um, federal mechanisms. Uh, we recognized, and as the study panel acknowledged in um, recommendation 12, that non-federal partners are the cornerstones of um, rapid and effective detection and response. Um, so we added the idea that the capabilities of non-federal entities should be accounted for in the biosurveillance strategy, um, but because we were never able to close that strategy as implemented, we also closed out that recommendation as unimplemented. Um, so concurrent with um, our work on the federal biosurveillance enterprise in 2009, we took our first look at the National Biosurveillance Integration Center, MBIC, um, and we reported on some of the same information sharing challenges that the study panel has pointed out in recommendation 13. And at the same time, we noted that MBIC had not employed the best practices for collaboration that, that we recommend, um, most notably clearly defining its mission and clearly defining roles and responsibilities across the collaboration. Um, so in 2009, we recommended that MBIC take those actions that were in its own purview to try to improve that collaboration. Nevertheless, when we revisited the situation in 2015, we found little progress on the data sharing challenges and even more troublesome, about a third of the partners we interviewed expressed general doubt about the feasibility of MBIC's mission. Um, interestingly, we found that many of the partners believed in the importance of a central federal biosurveillance integrator. Um, but at the same time, we found many of the agencies with direct biosurveillance roles had established other data and information sharing channels that did not involve MBIC. Um, by analyzing relevant documents like the authorizing legislation and the MBIC strategic plan and analyzing the content of the interviews we conducted with federal partners around the expectations for MBIC, we were able to identify three distinct functions that MBIC was filling or expected to fill. Um, and MBIC had partial efforts in each of them, but also faced challenges in each and was not able to dedicate itself to fulfilling any of them completely. So the functions we identified were the analyzer, um, who uses technological tools and subject matter expertise to develop shared situational awareness, um, create 
meaningful new insights from disparate data sets um, that could not be gleaned in isolation. The coordinator who develops networks to be able to rapidly convene multidisciplinary partners across organizational boundaries so that they can tap the analytical uh, capability to develop shared understanding of emergent signals. Um, and the innovator who facilitates the development of new tools and approaches to address gaps in biosurveillance integration. Because the question of which of these functions should be MBIC's focus and what kind of resources should be dedicated to making it more successful is more of a policy question than a performance auditing question, we presented our findings in the form of options and challenges without making a recommendation. However, the study panel's recommendation 13, that the viability of the National Biosurveillance Integration System should be assessed, and the finding that the department continues to try to make it work while ongoing issues confound its utility resonates with our findings. Um, I would caution, however, that even overcoming the data sharing challenges detailed in the, the blueprint um, would not necessarily solve the conundrum that, that MBIC face. There's a cost for trans transforming and amassing volumes of disparate data and the value of this kind of integration as a tool for early detection and warning is not fully proven. To be successful, there must be a clear definition of the mission need to guide expectations for what kind of signals AMBIC should attempt to discern amongst the noise that would be created. The work that the department is currently doing to make it work, um, AMBIC's stalwart effort to produce daily surveillance reports offers a demonstration of these issues. As we collected information for our last report, we observed that a great deal of daily operational um, energy was invested in creating these reports, but few of any of the, the partners who reported, who had day-to-day -day operational biosurveillance missions reported that these were useful to them. Um, and most of them expressed frustration or confusion, noting that the information was either irrelevant to them or came many days after they were aware of the event without adding any new meaning or value. So speaking of defining the mission need, I'm going to conclude my remarks with a recap of two BioWatch reports. Uh, a lot of uh, what we found has already been discussed here today, so I won't belabor. Um, but in 2012, <laughs> we talked about how DHS had deployed the earliest detectors very quickly and had not gone through any formal effort to define the mission need, had not assessed alternatives to meeting that need, and had not established clear requirements. And so as the program progressed, uh, um, officials aimed to produce a better BioWatch program, um, trying to get to, I think, what Secretary McDonald talked about with the, the time that it takes to produce a report. Um, and they, they were building on that, the older generation trying to produce a result in less than six hours. Um, so in this context, and based on the general perception that there was already departmental um, consensus, DHS forged ahead um, without clear requirements or testing and sought to acquire an automated system to address the time issues without a comprehensive and systematic effort to ground the acquisition in a well-defined mission need and set of requirements that would allow it to assess uh, uh, against that need. So we raised questions both about the, the assumption that an automated system was the only solution, and we pointed to the need to be specific about the broader benefit of this kind of environmental monitoring as part of a layered biodetection approach, given the considerable uncertainty about both likelihood and magnitude magnitude of biological attack with one of the limited number of aerosolized pathog pathogens BioWatch is designed to detect. Um, and to that end, it was promising to hear Tim Morrison talk about taking a look across the entire enterprise about what's working, what's missing, and how to prioritize. Um, we, so we recommended that DHS halt the Gen 3 activities, which um, it subsequently did after conducting an alternative um, analysis, and then as in 2015, um, as Senator Lee and alluded to earlier, we revisited the program and found that, um, in, that the department had specified the aim was to detect attacks large enough to cause 10,000 or more ca casualties, but it had not defined the operational requirements associated with that goal to allow it to draw conclusions about system capabilities from performance testing or model, mo um, modeling. So we recommended that DHS establish performance requirements for Gen 2 and clarify operational requirements. 
and then test the system against these needs to establish its capability as a baseline for any future enhancements. Um, and we recommended that any future enhancements should apply best practices for testing and evaluation. Those two recommendations remain open. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, uh, Ms. Godfrey. Uh, both for, uh, frankly, the extent to which you validated and agree with some of our concern, but also the way in which you point forward. Governor. Yes. Doctor, did I hear you correctly that uh, you're able to monitor 2.6 million emergency room visits a day? That's right. The okay. current system has 65% of emergency departments in, in the in the system. There are different data use agreements with different jurisdictions about who can see what's going on there, but the volume of data is 2.6 million emergency department visits is, a day. Is, is, I'm trying to figure it out my mind. I, I, it's the era of big data, and you got it. Is there a standard form or that these emergency rooms fill out so that uh, you, uh, through perhaps a design of your own internal algorithm, can pull out information? Because you certainly can't assess manually 2.6 million, million visits a day. That, that's right. This so they, is, um, they do it according this, to a form this is you've a given cloud. It's not a form. It's, it's the way that they're um, dealing with their encounters is captured in a cloud-based um, system. So their algorithms based on uh, chief complaints, you know, is Excellent. it a respiratory illness, a diarrheal illness? Um, right now we're adapting this system for overdose detection. It's the system by opioid. which we're monitoring the yeah, opioid yeah, okay. epidemic. Talk to, talk to me a little, a little bit about pharma. Uh, you've got uh, thousands and thousands of uh, pharmacies. Uh, one would think that if, without revealing privacy, but mm -hmm. uh, is, there, is there any mandated reporting of, of uh, antibiotic use or, or uh, uh, to you on a regular, on a daily basis, so you could see if certain parts of the country there's a prescription. The, the system that I'm, anything from that? Yeah, the system that I'm describing is such that different streams of data could be right. um, could reside there, and different uh, allowed secure users could access information. In terms of the the pharma data, I'll say one thing: we're rolling out this season, which we wished we'd had last year was um, an app that provides information about antivirals against influenza and their availability in different pharmacies. You may recall people having to drive around and call around to find out where's the antiviral, where is it still in stock? So we are working with uh, the private sector, with pharma, to make some of those data accessible to the public or to, to specialized users. Right now, um, the amount of um, pharma data that's in accessible through this national syndromic surveillance platform and, and biosense platform is is probably relatively limited we are linking in the poison center data into that system so it, it's um, the idea is is no longer you know you fill out a form and you try to get everybody to do the same form but you use what the healthcare system has and make um, make that accessible with um, as you say with algorithms are they mandated to file it or is it voluntary uh, None of this is mandated. It's not? No. Uh, Jim, it's too bad it should be. Um, without revolving privacy, I mean, very interesting. We'll have to take that up. Yeah. Jim, you know, one of the interesting, I thought it was interesting, one of the observations I made as secretary is that we have multiple testing capabilities around the federal government. DOD's got theirs, Justice has theirs, DH has theirs, and blah, 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 blah. One of these days, maybe we'll just have a couple of centralized testing. And Catherine, you brought up operational requirements. And I've often wondered whether or not, since we set up the department, whether the testing capability within the department has matured to the point where by watch four or looking for new technology, you can say to the private sector, these are the these are the operational needs. Of these these are the requirements. Come on and test, and we'll, we'll we'll choose the most effective one. Do we do that yet? Yes, sir. Uh, How difficult so it is to get your testing? Okay, we do. Please. Well, so there, there's a lot of discussion going on about testing, but uh, so DNDO when it was created, but back in uh, 2006, has statutory authority for doing test and evaluation of systems, research and development. And sort of getting across the what's you know, technology valley of death, so things get developed to a certain stage and then they just stop and they never get into the field. So DNDO 
the structure was developed specifically to do that. Now, what we've done, uh, so Lisa Gordon Haggerty has taken over at NNSA. She chairs a group called the MEC, the Mission Executive Council, which brings together DOD, the intelligence community, myself, and others. And one of the things we're actually looking at across all the agencies is how we're doing testing and where are test beds that we can leverage each other's activities, those types of things. Uh, the reason we went through DOD on this acquisition that we're doing, or this rapid capability for BD21, is to leverage all the DOD testing activities. So we'll have test plans that have to be done as part of the acceptance criteria, but we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We're just taking advantage of what DOD has already done. Do you use any of the national labs for that purpose? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. We, in fact, uh, we just had a meeting with sort of the big five uh, a couple of weeks ago on the big data analytics piece and how that is going to work and how they can help. But we do testing at the labs quite a bit. Are you familiar today with whether or not there are any existing mature technologies that would be could be immediately embedded and substituted for BioWatch, which none of us really believe in? Uh, yes, sir. That's in, in fact what I was talking about. Deploying technology next month, we'll be putting stuff in the field in the United States and trying it out based on what DoD has learned and deploying the systems overseas. Excellent. So, there's the, the technologies there. It's the, the ch bigger challenge is going to be developed in the con ops with state and local responders and identifying the sort of what's the bell curve for bio for what's what's an anomaly. On rad nuke, it's pretty easy. Even radiation or you don't. Chem is very similar. But bio, you know, when the cherry blossom festival is going on, the air is a lot different than a cold, rainy day. So understanding that background is part of the reason that we're doing the initial deployment for testing. So this is field test and evaluation in 12 different locations around the country. So we're literally sampling different air and different environments and building that data set. Thank you, sir. Uh, thanks. Just a couple of quick questions. Um, you know, I really appreciate this last exchange you had, uh, Secretary McDonald, with, with Governor Ridge, because I think one of the impressions that I, I've had is that after 2001, we, we really uh, rushed to get things in place, including BioWatch. It never fully uh, delivered on our hopes for it, but part of what I, I think we all assumed was that that so much had happened in the development of technology since then that there were better technologies. And I, and I believe I'm hearing you say that you, you agree with that, basically, and you think that DOD now has um, tested and has some systems that we can use here domestically that will really bring us to, uh, as close to up to date as we can and, and have a much more effective system than BioWatch. Yes, sir. And uh, I think there's two parts to this. Uh, the, other, the other part of it is, is incentivizing business. Um, you know, when you look at BioWatch and you say you have 34 locations around the country, essentially a vacuum cleaner and a filter system, it's not very enticing right. for businesses to invest their own resources in to try to compete. Um, we've got a plan laid out where we, we, what we hope to have is 9,000 locations by 2025 with real-time biodetection integrated into a real-time data analytics system. So it's uploading, uplinking data real-time and handheld equipment that's also linked. And that becomes pretty enticing for businesses, uh, large and small, and innovators to be able to say, hey, I'd like to, I'd like to play in this operating environment. And we're also building the system to have an open architecture so it can literally be plug and play. So we want to incentivize small businesses being able to say, hey, I've got one piece of the solution. I want to be able to plug it into the system. And I think that over time that, that will, there'll be a lot more money spent on the system in in new technologies and people there'll be better competition so i used to own a small business i would have loved to have been in this sort of at the ground floor but we're, we're getting a lot of interest from industry and i think that's really the the big win in the long run it's not you know a small government laboratory doing its own thing over and over again it really needs to be people out there that are developing really good technology really to do the job it's not like you're you're artificially creating a, a demand for this equipment to really do the uh, BioWatch job, you, you've got to have that uh, many yes, sir. facilities well, this, and locations. As an example, on the nuclear side, since the Nunn-Luger legislation back yeah. in 96, uh, about 60,000 nuclear detectors have been purchased in, in the United States and deployed. 
Um, none of them currently transmit, well, not sure to say none. We have some programs now where we're starting to have so they transmit data. So you can actually get a, a, an operating picture right. from the information flow. Um, I see the bio detection it, very similar. If we, had, if we had done bio when we were worried about loose nukes, then we might have been in the same space. But I think the, the problem that happened with as, the, as bio evolved was the Office of Health Affairs was given responsibility for chem bio defense, but had no discretionary budget to actually move the ball forward. So while we, it's easy to beat up on BioWatch, the people that run BioWatch actually do an excellent job, and it does what it was designed to do very, very well. It's just what it was designed to do isn't what we need today. Yeah. So I want to I want to uh, clarify what you said in your opening statement because I think it's important not not too exciting but important which is that uh, it's important to you that Congress authorize in statute the office that you had because without that authorization your authority with regard to am I right chemical and biological is not uh, as comprehensive or strong as it should be yes sir exactly um, so for example. BD-21, the, the program that we launched, was yeah. done with the reprogramming. Those funds will run out sort of early 19. I don't have the ability to move money across the mission space currently because the way the appropriations are separate. Um, I have all the authorities I need on the rad nuke side, everything from doing international agreements to R&D to rapid prototyping to acquisition of life cycle sustainment, but do not have similar authorities for chem and bio. We just Oh, the Office of Health Affairs just wasn't designed the way DNDO was. So the plan is to take those authorities and just say it applies across the board. So that, that allows that flexibility, and then the appropriators can appropriate accordingly. Right. So we'll, we'll try to help. Uh, I presume you're in touch with White House uh, 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 Congressional Liaison. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Sugar, one, one question. Uh, you, you really reported some uh, very exciting uh, progress and uh, I was going to ask that same question. Did I, uh, Tom? Did, did I hear you right? <laughs> Two point six million a day. That's really important. Is that a capacity now to know what's going on in emergency rooms quickly? In any sense, a uh, substitute for BioWatch, or is it more a complementary system? Gives us a kind of maybe it's not right to say redundancy, but but uh, it's another way to get at the problem. You know, these are complementary issues. The BioWatch is looking at the environment, what's in the air for a select number of, of agents or pathogens. Right. The emergency department data is important and it's, you know, large scale. It's a syndrome level. It's, you know, respiratory illness, diarrheal right. illness, drug overdose. The laboratory systems for human illness and for animal illness are really important and those need to be you know, um, modernized, quick, very sensitive, because, um, you know, respiratory illness could be influenza or many other things. Sure. Influenza could be many different strains of influenza. Which one is the one that's going to cause the next pandemic? You need to have laboratory evaluation of the clinical specimens. So I think these are multiple complementary right. detection or surveillance systems that together give you an operating picture that's, that leads to action. Good. Thank you. Senator Daschle. Well, let me first uh, commend all three of you. We really appreciate your uh, excellent presentations this morning and uh, the insights you've given us. And I, in the interest of time, I might just limit myself uh, to one question to you, Secretary McDonald. The National Bio uh, Surveillance Center obviously was given the responsibilities to aggregate and analyze biological data across the federal government. We have noted that uh, the viability of the center really should be assessed, that it's, uh, that it, the question, I guess, is whether it's living up to the expectations that we had when, when the agency was created. What are you doing to assess the center's capabilities and challenges with regard to biosurveillance data integration? A major challenge in this whole context and uh, a, a role that obviously I think requires uh, almost an ongoing um, appreciation of uh, the change in technology, the change in circumstances. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on, on what we're doing in that context? Yes, sir. Um, so I'm not a big fan of studies in uh, 
strategy sometimes when they don't get implemented, right? I mean, if you see you see studies get done, get a list of actions, nothing ever happens with them. Um, so 2012, NBIC did a, a uh, biosurveillance strategy. Um, 2016, they were cycling to do another one. Um, when uh, the current administration uh, came in, it was uh, the NBIC budget was zeroed out, and uh, in the budget request, it was put back in by the appropriators, and they said, give me a five-year plan for NBIC. Um, so I met with the the NBIC team, and I said, okay, well, given given the current state of play, the five-year plan looks a lot like we're going to spend the money that was appropriated this year, and that's going to be zero next year and for the next four years. So not a great plan. So I said, look, you have available to you the big data that the doctor has talked about, the, the National Targeting Center as a, as a physical infrastructure capability that the Department of Homeland Security has. So I said, instead of saying, this is NBIC and here's where I want to take it, say in five years, what should a really good biosurveillance capability look like and then work backwards and do an implementation plan for that. So design the perfect system, understanding that what we have at our disposal now is an is un unbelievable amount of data. So instead of sitting on Vermont Avenue with a couple of TV screens and a half a dozen analysts, you can say, pick the team up, go to where the data is, and, and then looking at that big data the analytic capability, all of, all of the resources that are available, say, how would you do this and what would a perfect system look like? So that's the challenge that the team had. That document is actually in review right now to be released to, to, to meet our congressional requirements. And I'm actually very optimistic. I think uh, what we will do is we will, the, the team will do a very good job operating out of the National Targeting Center. Uh, we're not gonna duplicate data sets, but what we do have is the ability to share data across agencies. So for example, DITRA, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency has created, I've got to read this one, uh, biosurveillance ecosystem. Um, so DOD has put a lot of money into this. Uh, the NBIC team has been, is, or is in the process of being certified to be an interagency host for that information, and we intend to use that same big data cloud. So what we're trying to do is get the, the people where the data is and where decision makers are. So one of the problems, I think, uh, uh, the the morning reports or the daily reports were mentioned. So I get a daily report from, from NBEC. I, I pay attention to it right now because of Ebola, We're tracking that very closely. But the, the real question is, and all of this work, is how is it relevant to the operators to make decisions? And if the information isn't flowing into somebody to be able to make a decision, then it's not really relevant information. So by putting the, the NBIC team where the folks are that are controlling all the goods and people coming in and out of the United States, we think that's actually the right lash up because now the, the, the person that's going to say that container is not allowed here or that ship has to be anchored off and be quarantined, well, we can't quarantine. The CDC person that's at the targeting center would say that. But it's, it's integrating the data at the place the operational decisions are made and where the data exists. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Tom. Jim? Thanks, Joe. <clears throat> thank you all for being here, and, and moreover, thank you all for your uh, making so much of your career you know, in, in public service. Um, Dr. Shuket, a uh, question for you, and if either of the other panelists have responses, I'd be happy to hear those as well. But I was also impressed by the progress that you reported at CDC, but I want to focus on diagnostics um, and ask you wh where you find the gaps in terms of being able to get as close to real-time diagnosis in a variety of settings, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, whether it's battlefield, whether it's in hospital, whether it's in some catastrophe in the environment, in, the, in society. Um, what, what, where are the gaps, and, and what do you think are the, the technological frontiers that are um, that we need to have um, our the private sector um, uh, pursue? Yeah, thank you. There, there's been so many advances, and, and the commercial diagnostic tests are taking care of a lot of the common things that clinicians or, or um, healthcare needs. But many of the diagnostic questions that we have in biodefense or in you know uh, public health are not don't have markets. You know, the the unusual pathogen um, doesn't necessarily have a market. Um, BARDA has been helping incentivize some of the development of diagnostics in that space, and, and obviously NIH doing basic research and CDC doing a lot of the deployment and evaluations. 
But one thing that's really important for these emerging threats is the ability to rapidly develop a new test and deploy it. We have tools right now that, that help with that. You know, lots of the technology is the easy part, the polymerized chain reaction or, or some of the other approaches. But there's a, a regulatory process that we use, the emergency use authorization that FDA will allow us to deploy a new test and the labs can pick that up. Um, the the um, sustainability and incentives for that whole process probably could bear looking. I mean, it's it's worked when we had a new pathogen like Middle East Respiratory Syndrome or Zika, but the um, we ended up having a lot of coordination challenges around, you know, many different groups were developing Zika tests, making sure they were accurate, making sure they were deployed, and making sure the information got into a detection system. I, th I think there were probably gaps in the information being recovered and then the, um, the speed with which we could get deployment. Uh, thanks, Jim. I mean, we're way over uh, schedule. Yeah, but I, I wanted to ask if anybody had, had any questions. We had so much talent over there. I hate to have them. So, no, you go ahead, Gov. Right. Any questions from the ex-officios? Experienced, wise, sitting like Supreme Court justices over there. <laughs> The, um, the global cooperation is just essential for the natural and the other threats as well. Um, after the 2014-15 Ebola response, um, the global community stepped back and said, "We are not doing our job. We need to. We need every country to be able to, to um, find, stop, and prevent epidemics, and we need the global community to surge." The World Health Organization really has stepped up in response to huge criticism in 2014-15 and have been um, leading a much more coordinated, effective response in, in the DRC Ebola outbreaks. In terms of China, there are different ways that we are cooperating, particularly around influenza and specimen sharing and sequence sharing, because it's a, a global threat rather than a national threat. But I think there's always um, room for improvement with um, some of the countries that are less transparent or, or less um, collegial. Anybody else? Yes. So yes, uh, Mr. McDonald, I think we all appreciate from the comments that you've heard about um, the advances that you're talking about that are desired in BioWatch. Would you be willing to say in an open setting what the technology is that you're basing this on, where the first responders would be sort of taking the first cut? Um, so I'm actually not technically competent to explain the, uh, the different technologies. Uh, but that being said, um, so there's, it's going to be multiple phases. So first, the first thing we're doing now is triggers. And, and having those in, initial indicators, it just says, hey, there's something wrong here. Then the, the next phase will be the handheld equipment that operators will go downrange with. That'll be informed greatly by what DOD and, and other organizations currently use. Um, what we are going to shift away from on uh, the nuclear side as well is we're going, not going to discuss publicly any longer where we have capability, what its capability is. So uh, you're not going to see RFPs, for example, in the future that says if you if you you know you keep your radiation signal below this level, it'll get through the port. I, I think that that over time, is there's just been too much information that's been public, but uh, there there are opportunities to discuss it in, in sort of more 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 closed sessions. So, so um, I can't resist just the last question to you briefly, um, Dr. Shogut, since you're here. And to make a real again how ongoing this is, um, tell us about the polio-like illnesses you're dealing with now. What, what are you finding, and is there a threat that it will spread more broadly within the U.S.? Yeah, this is a very um, upsetting and concerning condition. It appears that since 2014, for sure, there's been every other year um, outbreaks. Um, uh, yesterday, we updated the statistics for this year with 90 
children so far in 2018. 90. Uh, uh, 90 this year with a couple, with about 150 others that are under investigation. Being ill, in other words. Um, not, not absolutely. And actually, I just recently got to meet with some of the families where I think I think sometimes on the news you hear it's weakness in an arm or a leg. Right. They're, they're children that are quadriplegic from this. Um, uh -huh. they're, they're some very severe um, situations. It's, it's really um, very touching and moving to talk to the families that are coping with this. Right now, most of the illness um, follows a viral-like syndrome, a cough or respiratory problem, a little bit of uh, some of the cases have had a diarrheal illness. So we do think that there's a, a viral illness that triggers the neurologic response, um, and it, it appears much like polio, but it isn't polio. There's suggestion in a number of cases of an enterovirus, which is, a polio is an enterovirus, but these are other ones. But we don't know whether the body's reacting to the virus in some sort of immune fashion or if the virus itself is causing the condition. CDC's developed a task force bringing clinical experts, research experts, um, and public health experts together to advise both about a research agenda to help get to the bottom of what this is and how we can deal with it, and then also to update the clinical guidance that, that um, emergency departments, urgent care, pediatricians, um, deal with. Um, it's it's um, not likely that it's over. You know, this is the season each of these every other years that we see it, but we really want to learn as much as we can from what's already happened and be more ready for next year or more likely two years from now when we expect it to increase again. Um, it's different than what we were seeing 10 years ago, right. but we don't um, we don't have all the answers. And, and it's not... Uh, uh preventable by taking the polio vaccine. No, it's not. Absolutely not. I mean, the children are, are pretty much vaccinated for the things right. that are recommended, but we don't have a clear enough idea of what a target for a vaccine would be or what the what the full pathway of, of the illness is. So I think we have a lot of work to do, and both CDC and NIH and um, the, the academic research community and the public health community are, are working hard on this when now. When you say get ready for it, what, what does that mean? I mean oh, you, you're not going to create a new vaccine just no, for No, but um, one of the challenges um, is that on the first presentation of an illness, um, people may think, oh, you know, it looks like a mild thing. It'll get better. You go away. You don't really get all the specimens. We want to have the emergency departments, pediatricians, ready to go to get the best clinical specimens right away. Um, so that we can get learn more about the causes. It, it may be we haven't found clear-cut laboratory evidence because of the type of specimens we've gotten and the timing and the type of tests that were run on them. Well, the second thing to get ready is to be ready with clinical trials because um, right now the, the families have gone through all these different treatments and we're really not clear what things may make it better or mitigate the course of it. And so ideally you'd be ready to go in a future season. It usually is sort of August, September, October timing with um, ability for potential illness to be, the, the families to enroll their children in, a clinical, in clinical trials. So I would say we want to get ready to learn as much as we can going forward while we learn as much as we can from what's already happened with these families' experiences. Thanks for that report. Really thanks more generally for the work that CDC does to focus in on a, on a, on a real heartbreaking uh, outbreak like that. Uh, overall, uh, this has been a really encouraging testimony, and uh, I, I'd like to say we'd like to get back together about a year from now and hear how, how you're doing. It doesn't have to be at this big setting. It could be, but we could just have a meeting uh, with you and the members of the panel. Uh, for now, thank you very much. It's time for lunch. Late, but we're going to have it.